This episode is supported by The Pleasure Chest, my favorite place to shop for toys, lube, and more to make the most of your sex life. They offer free discreet shipping over $75, and it's super easy to find exactly what you're looking for on their website, whether that's a new vibe, dildo, cock ring, or kink set. Learn more and start shopping at thepleasurechest.com. Again, that's the pleasure chest at thepleasurechest.com. What would it take to arouse your life, to experience more connection, more pleasure, more realness in and outside of the bedroom? I'm August McLaughlin, and this is Girl Boner Radio. How do you feel about orgasms? Have you ever experienced one that went far beyond fun or pleasure or release or struggled to have one in the first place? If your answers are yes or yes, you are far from alone. Phone sex operator Amberly Rothfield had just gone through a several month sex hiatus when she experienced an orgasm that changed her life. Author Dr. Samantha Allen had started to think orgasms were no longer a part of her life when two years after sex reassignment surgery, she was surprised by one. And therapist Vanessa Marin had her first orgasm on the playground as a child, only to struggle in the climax department years later. I am excited and honestly honored to share these awesome women's stories today all of which show that we can discover new types of pleasure at any stage of life. Now, Amberly's story. Amberly Rothfield is a top-performing phone sex operator, clip creator, and webcam model who teaches models how to increase their bottom line online. She's also a devoted wife and mother, whose partner came out as trans a couple of years ago. So I was literally, physically, about five feet that way, Um, (laughs) like in this room. And it was a year, not a year after my wife came out, but a year after she had been on hormones. So her body is honestly five bazillion times different than it was before. I did not realize the drastic changes that just some chemicals make in what you would look like. And I'm not gonna lie, like I was never going to leave my wife ever, but you have concerns about what's going to change and how are you going to adapt with that change? And as a partner of someone who came out as trans, like my inclination is to make it all about her because she's the one that's lived this life. Like, and you've met my wife, like before her transition, very like full beard, like manly, man, man, man. Like it's been so drastic. So I want to make it all about her, but at the same time you have your own concerns too. But at the time I was actively trying not to think about it because I'm like, I'm being selfish. I haven't lived a life where I felt like I was in the wrong body. So it's about a year after. And honestly, we had probably gone, get super personal here, a few months without having any kind of sexual encounters. And it's 300% my fault. Like not 100, 300%. I was actively avoiding it because I was like, now that the most significant changes have happened, I don't know how I feel about this. And then I was like, but a lover and like there's things that we both need so mood was right it was shabbat we were drunk off of you know sacramental wine <laughs> and i was like screw it no i'm not gonna avoid it this time let's go for it i i remember during the orgasm moment leading up to it i was like oh my gosh this feels the same it feels like it's it's just my partner and it's amazing and then I had, actually, I had a way better orgasm than I've ever had. I'm not going to lie, that could be attributed to just going months without. Who knows? <laughs> a little extra anticipation. Right? 
you know, Betty Dodson, yeah. mother of masturbation. Mm-hmm. She talks about blue balls and blue clit. Blue clit. Like there can be a buildup. Exactly. Yeah. It could be like a massive blue clit situation going on. But I also like to believe that it wasn't a hundred percent blue clit. I'm not gonna lie. I like a good pair of boobs. I had boobs in my face and I'm getting to touch her body's more curvaceous than it once was. So I'm getting to feel these curves that weren't there before. And it was a really great new sensation. And right as I'm coming down from the climax, I remember thinking that was like the best orgasm of my life. It was like having the first orgasm ever. And then I thought about it. I was like, it kind of, it's the first orgasm with my new air quotes partner. It was really cool. This dichotomy of being with my partner, but also her new body. So anywho, Mm -hmm. I loved it. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. (laughs) How did that impact your sense of sexuality moving forward or or maybe your relationship to orgasms? Um, I like to tell people I'm lesbian. When my wife came out as trans, it was like the best moment of my life because I was like, oh, I don't have this identity crisis anymore. Life makes sense. She was a woman. But I've also never been with a trans woman before. So I'm not going to lie. I think the resistance of me not wanting to sleep with her was because now you're very obviously I don't like saying that but like in my head it was more trans I don't like that but like it was there and having to confront that it's made it to where no like I actually do enjoy way more trans porn than I had before and it wasn't just a oh those are pretty bodies this was like this is super fucking sexy I know how that feels now it gave me that sense of empathy and sympathy that I didn't have. So now like, I like to say my orgasms are more rich now. I'm not as inhibited. I'm not coming up to this moment where I'm like, is it going to be good? Is it going to be good? Is it? Because prior to that, before like we went on that three month hiatus, there was a lot of, is it going to be good? I don't know. Like this, I've never done this before. And I was very tense. I was very like not being in the moment. So I didn't get that enjoyment. It sounds like this experience and also your approach and the mindset and your relationship really helped broaden your eroticism. It did. I had chills listening to that. Oh, thank you. It did. It it made me confront some stuff inside of me that I didn't even know I had. Thank goodness. Slayed. Dead. The beast will never rise again. I think especially because I grew up in Dallas, Texas where it was very, 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 very conservative. And and being lesbian, like liking women in that sense, I still, even though I was lesbian, had some sort of heteronormative thing going on in my head. And it was being forced to be confronted with that in a physical form. Because it's one thing to watch it again online, even to get off, even to masturbate with this stuff online. But it's another thing to have it in front of you. And it really did change not just my way of thinking but also made it to where I can relax and enjoy this rather than having my East Texas upbringing clicking in my head telling me this is wrong this is wrong yeah yeah it won't feel good I promise because it's wrong it's so easy to absorb those messages and not know that we have them not know because I think we all absorb every kind of you know transphobia biphobia misogyny, racism, like it's in all of us in some ways. We're sponges. We are sponges. And you had a sponge released, it sounds like. It was able to help you heal this this piece in you, which is beautiful. It did. It was it was a Clorox moment where you just sanitize that sponge. It was great. <laughs> That's really lovely. Have you had conversations with your partner about all of this? I did. We had a pillow talk moment afterwards where like, I told her why we had gone three months before. And I told her about my East Texas because not that I like to quote him, but Dr. Phil was saying that you think stuff 6,000 times faster than you can say it. So you can have a lot of thoughts go through your head faster than you could ever articulate them. And so I was telling her what was going through my head in that moment. And she was like, wow you've been in the adult industry for 15 years and you still got a hint of that in you. And I was like, sorry, 
but I told her that it was like the best orgasm of my life. And for her, she was like, that's exceptionally validating that you have been sleeping with me before I came out as trans, before I even knew what trans was or what I was. And for you to follow me through this process and then sleep with me after and be like, it's even better. She was like, I feel like a woman. And I'm like, that's the goal. To not just have a, a good time myself, obviously, but also to make her feel like the person she's supposed to be. Next, Samantha's story. Samantha Allen is the author of Real Queer America, LGBT Stories from Red States. It's an award-winning travelogue that the New York Times Book Review called a powerful book of memoir and reportage. Samantha's debut book, Love and Estrogen, tells the story of meeting her wife in a Kinsey Institute elevator, a real-life queer rom-com. I reached out to Samantha after reading an article she wrote for Splinter called How I Learned to Orgasm After Sex Reassignment Surgery. So you shared that writing this article a few years ago felt pretty vulnerable. What inspired you to go for it? Before I had the surgery, I was trying to find like really good information about, you know, like orgasm rate after the surgery or like how long it was taking people. The sources she was finding weren't very reliable, or they pointed to medical articles that a layperson might have trouble understanding. I was sitting with this experience for two years, talking about it with other transgender women, kind of in like back channels, you know, it's something we would whisper about or email to each other about. And I guess I just wanted to put something out there as intimate as it was that would help other people who are going through the same experience. When you went in to start the process, did you talk to your doctor about it? Did your doctor bring it up at all? You know, like when you do look at the medical literature, it's a pretty safe bet that you'll be able to orgasm again. You know, like rates of orgasm after a vaginoplasty are like very high. Samantha's doctor didn't seem worried about orgasm problems, but she said it's a common concern for many transgender women who have the surgery. Conversations with her partner inspired her to share about her experiences too. They both wondered... What are things going to look like after this? Like, how easy or hard are things going to be? Just a lot of questions swirling in your head that you just kind of have to figure the answers out to firsthand. You can read all of that literature, but nothing really fully prepares you for the experience of, like, relearning your own anatomy when you're an adult. Yeah, completely. I loved your opening, or it was near the beginning. You said, my vagina came with an instruction manual. What was your impression when you were going through your your instructions? Gosh, I mean, most of it was like aftercare instructions, stuff about like when you should go swimming or sit in a hot tub again, like there's regulations around how long you should wait to be immersed in water, but also stuff about how like your nerves are like literally coming back online and that you should be patient with yourself. There may have been something in there that was like, It takes people sometimes eight to 12 months to like figure out how to really have an orgasm again. Like, and that's fine. That was comforting to read. But then, you know, I got to 24 months and I was like, okay, what is going on? When you were talking about the frustration, you said that at a certain point you found out that there's a term, anorgasmia. Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, I speak only for myself, like being able to have an orgasm wasn't like a necessary precondition for me to have the surgery. Like my gender dysphoria was such that it needed to happen. And I was willing to accept some amount of risk that I would be anorgasmic, right? But it was comforting to know that it's a struggle that many transgender and cisgender women have in common. Figuring out orgasm is tricky. Not everyone gets there. Not everyone gets there easily. And And that's okay. It's normal. Especially in a culture where sex ed is so limited, especially around pleasure. But one day, Samantha did experience an orgasm. 
After about a year of frustration that she described as a watch pot never boils type scenario, as more months passed sans climax, she felt more and more like it would never happen, which only made things more challenging. It's not a really arousing thought to think like I'm never going to have an orgasm again. So while she wanted it to happen, she was also trying so hard not to fixate on it which made her feel like her mind was twisted up like a pretzel. So for me, it was almost like giving up on it that like freed it to happen. And after I stopped thinking about it as this teleological endpoint that I was trying to get to, spending time with myself and my vibrator, it just kind of happened and it took me completely by surprise. Orgasms before and after the surgery were different for Samantha, and she prefers how she experiences them now. Yeah, I mean, Eve Ensler added a monologue to the vagina monologues to be inclusive of transgender women who've had this surgery, and I think she described it really well as like, orgasm before feels very sudden and harsh, and then afterward, it's more like kind of like rolling waves of pleasure. To be honest, like orgasm before, it kind of feels a little bit like dying, sudden, and it's just like, boom, you just jump off a cliff and it's over, you know? And now it's more of these kind of like cascading waves of pleasure that kind of like roll through you. And it it just feels like a gentler, but still as intense experience. In her article, which was published in 2016, Samantha wrote, Now, when I want to orgasm, I have a routine that borders on superstition. I was curious about that and whether that's stuck around. After it first happened, I was like, okay, I need to exactly replicate these conditions. What was the thermostat set to an insane level of detail? I don't have exact specifications anymore. I feel like it helps to have some kind of ritual going into it because it helps me feel confident like this happened before, it can happen again. Thankfully, by now, gosh, it's been six years since I had the surgery. It's become, for me, a fairly automatic expectation. Myths abound in terms of transgender folks and sexuality, beyond just orgasms. Samantha wanted to shed light on this one in particular. Sometimes people are of this mindset that, like, men and women aren't different genders, but, like, different species almost. Like, men and women's bodies are just complete aliens. When you go through an experience like sex reassignment surgery, you realize that's not the case. You know, there's this misconception of, oh, you're just like chopping the penis off and that's what sex reassignment surgery is. And it's like, no, you're using tissue that could have easily developed into a vagina and and reshaping it in that form. It's more reuse, reduce, recycle than it is like chopping anything off, right? You know, we all start out at the same place in fetal development. We all start from one thing and we can go in these different directions and things like transgender hormone therapy and surgeries are about kind of bringing your body into alignment with the direction your heart went. I think that's the number one message I try to get out there is because people think, oh, like women and men are like the aliens compared to each other. It's like, no, the body is pretty similar. (laughs) And what does orgasm mean to you now? 
Uh, gosh, I wish I had a deep answer, but it's just like, it's a little treat, you know, it's nice to have to stay sane and feel grounded and, and feel relaxed. But I think one lesson I took from that is it's still not necessary for me to enjoy my time in the bedroom. And I think a lot of women can relate to this. It's still much easier for me to orgasm alone than it is with a partner. For me, it's nice if it happens with my partner, but it's not like the goal of spending intimate time. That's, I think, a healthy lesson that I took from the experience of having that two-year waiting period. Because I feel like if I hadn't had that, I would have just continued maybe approaching sex as like a means to having an orgasm and not necessarily as a means to deepening my connection. Now, Vanessa's story and her expert advice for anyone feeling challenged by the pursuit of orgasms. Vanessa Marin is a licensed psychotherapist specializing in sex therapy and online programs that help you transform your sex life. Long before her career started, she had her first orgasm. And at the time, she wasn't sure what happened. Yeah, I was in elementary school and just climbing the jungle gym, you know, having fun at recess. And all of a sudden, the jungle gym was feeling really good. (laughs) And it really caught me off guard. You know, I had no idea what it was that was happening. It got a little scared too. Like, did I hurt myself in some way? Is something broken? (laughs) But also just noticing like, whoa, that felt really enjoyable. Vanessa didn't really think much about the experience again until adulthood when she started trying to have orgasms on purpose. You know, at that point when I realized, oh, that's what was happening, I felt super embarrassed about it and kind of ashamed. And I realized now as I've gone on to do this work and help teach so many women how to orgasm that actually so many women have had experiences of that's their first orgasm. It was unintentional. It was something involving like jungle gym or ropes and stuff like that. And so now I I really like talking about the story because I think it's just so important to normalize that so many women have orgasms this way and there's nothing bad or wrong or icky about it. It's totally normal and very, very common. She told me that helping others learn how to have an orgasm became a passion and focus within her work when she started struggling to experience them with a partner. She had figured out how to intentionally orgasm on her own, and that was great. But she had difficulty translating that to climaxing during partnered sex. And it was even, you know, as I was going through training to become a sex therapist, (laughs) I'm still struggling with it. And so there was this added layer of imposter syndrome on top of all of it. You know, how can I not figure this out? And so I really experienced so many of the emotions that the women that I now work with experience, like feeling like something's wrong with you, you're broken in some way. The stuff that's supposed to work, you know, for every other woman out there doesn't work for you. And so honestly, yeah, it really came back to just being able to have this really deep understanding of what it's like to struggle with orgasm. And once I did figure it out for myself, realizing like, oh my gosh, it's so exciting to go through this process of exploring your orgasm and discovering what your body needs and being willing to advocate for yourself and your own pleasure. I get the pain and frustration and fear of not being able to, and I know how amazing it is to get to the other side, and I want women to be able to experience that too. Vanessa told me that if you are really struggling in the big O department, the first best step is to know that you are not alone and that there is nothing wrong with you. So many people have difficulties inviting an orgasm, especially people with vulvas. And I can say this from personal experience too. I truly felt like I'm the only woman in the world who has not figured this out. And every woman that I've worked with has said some variation of that. Like, I really must be the only person. Something is horribly wrong with me. So it sounds very simple, but really just starting with that understanding of nothing is wrong with you. Secondly, Vanessa pointed out that orgasm is a skill and one that can take time, patience, and more understanding to get a grasp on. It's something you can learn how to do and that will go smoother if you ease up on yourself. In terms of actionable steps you can take, Vanessa said it's all about self-exploration, summed up in one word. 
masturbation is the absolute best way to just explore your body, get a sense of what does my body respond to? What does it not respond to? Um, and really playing around with lots of different kinds of stimulation is the best way to get there. I love Vanessa's advice. While you're setting aside time to explore your own body, you could experiment with your hands or different toys and a good lubricant. Reading or listening to erotica can also help. And if you have a vulva, you could also try OMG Yes. It's this membership-based website full of video tutorials based on interviews with over 20,000 cisgender women about their sexual pleasure. I'm not affiliated, just a fan. Learn more about today's guests and their latest work at the links in the show notes or on my blog at augustmclaughlin.com. And if you are enjoying Girl Boner Radio, I would so appreciate it if you would post a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or the iTunes Store. And please do tell your friends about it. You can also support the show while getting fun bonus content by joining my community at patreon.com slash girlboner. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>